Hello, Wonder Hussy here. Obviously not in the desert anymore. No, sir, I left Death Valley a week ago. I left Nevada a couple days ago. And now I'm in the beautiful state of Idaho. Okay, this is the Snake River as it flows down through the town of Twin Falls, Idaho. This is called Shoshone Falls, and it's actually higher than Niagara Falls. I guess they call it the Niagara of the West. I think it's 42 feet higher than Niagara Falls and something like a thousand feet wide. You can even see there's like, well, maybe you can see there's a rainbow coming off the mist there. And there's kayaks, look at that. I guess you can kayak right up to the bottom of these things. Yikes, uh, that'd be a little bit too rich for my blood. I'd be afraid of getting sucked down. But, I mean, can you imagine the force of that water where it's hitting the bottom? Imagine if you were like one of those early American explorers, you know, like, well, Lewis and Clark actually didn't come this way. They, I think they went north of here, but you know, these early American explorers, you know, you load up your canoe with all your supplies, you're a mountain man, you're paddling down this beautiful snake river through this gorgeous desert canyon and everything's going just great and you're making good time and you feel like you're gonna be to the California gold fields in no time and then you run into this I don't think there's any kayaker on the face of this earth who could navigate those rapids although now that I think about it with all those like extreme sports guys like those Mountain Dew extreme sportsters they're probably or Red Bull one of those Red Bull guys probably did well, don't people go over Niagara Falls in a barrel? Actually, speaking of daredevils, this Snake River Canyon is actually the site of a really famous daredevil stunt. Uh, most of you watching this video will probably remember Evil Knievel jumping over the Snake River Gorge back in 1974. That's right, we're gonna go way back in time to September 8th, I think it was, 1974, when Evil Knievel jumped, or tried to jump, this whole canyon. Okay, for the one or two of you watching who might not know who Evil Knievel was, he was the most badass stuntman daredevil in the entire world. And I guess if you were a little kid, in the late 60s or 1970s, he was probably your idol. He rode a, a really big, clunky Harley Davidson that I guess is really heavy and not meant for jumping things. They didn't have that technology back then, but he rode this big, clunky Harley Davidson that was painted all red, white, and blue. He had this whole red, white, and blue jumpsuit that he wore, and he would jump over Greyhound buses, monster trucks. They would just stack cars up for him to jump. He would jump over anything, and so I guess he wanted to jump over the Grand Canyon down in Arizona. And they actually said yes at first, but then when they realized he was serious, I guess they changed their mind. And so since he couldn't jump over the Grand Canyon, well, then he had to go to plan B, which was the Snake River. Anyway, uh, I guess, well, we could walk a little bit farther. It looks like there's another viewpoint up there that might be even more spectacular. And standing up there, we might get a sense of just how friggin' ballsy Evil Knievel was to try and jump this thing. I mean, even from down here, you do get a sense of what this dude would have had to have done. I mean, I've actually read up on Evil Knievel's life, and as a person, he doesn't sound like he was a very good person. He certainly wasn't a very good husband or father, but well, say what you will about his personal life, he, I won't even say he had brass balls, man. He had balls that were made of <laughs> titanium. I don't know what's stronger or heavier than brass. I mean, this dude, would basically do anything for publicity, for a dare to prove his manhood. I'm not sure why he was doing all these things. I mean, he did make a lot of money. You know, remember when he jumped the fountains at Caesar's Palace? That was another big one. Oh, well, I think he failed that one too. And that's what I think is kind of, I mean, even though he was supposedly a horrible person, that's the redeeming factor I find in the Evil Knievel story is that he became super successful for failing. I think he failed like half his jumps. I mean, he failed this jump, he failed the Caesar's Palace fountain jump, and those were probably his two most high profile jumps. So you've got to hand it to somebody who fails repeatedly, but becomes successful despite all that. Okay, I'm actually not sure how you get up to that viewpoint because the road or the trail is fenced off and it says no trespassing. I think there is some kind of 12 mile long canyon rim trail you can take, but it's 12 miles long 
and it's gonna be like 97 degrees today. It's hot, I don't wanna hike 12 miles. So instead of going up to that viewpoint, let's uh, get back in the car and drive down the road to the exact location where Evil Knievel attempted his infamous jump of the Snake River Canyon. Okay, we're here. And I'm not even really sure I know where here is. I actually came to this spot before. I was traveling through Idaho like seven years ago with my sister and we were just kind of poking along looking for interesting tourist attractions and so we did go to what I thought was the Evil Knievel jump site but I don't remember it being down this long dirt road you know going through all these farm fields and then like it just doesn't look like much of a tourist attraction although you can see by the stickers here that there have been some adrenaline junkies that have visited this spot i don't even know what these stickers are but they all look like the kind of guys that are into Brrrr, dirt bikes side by sides off-roading crazy any kind of crazy vehicle evil knievel is sort of like the patron saint of those guys and in a way evil knievel is kind of like my patron saint i do a lot of things that people think are really crazy and dangerous which i'll let you in on a little secret they're not i'm actually pretty square and i'm pretty squared away like i try to do everything safely but I do like to take chances, and I like to live large, and I like to wear... Oh, look, I'm even wearing a Harley Davidson shirt, all patriotic, red, white, and blue. I definitely feel a kinship with Evil Knievel uh, as far as his professional career is concerned, not as far as his personal life is concerned. Okay, let's walk up this trail. I'm guessing this leads to the exact spot back in September 1974 where Evil Knievel tried to jump over this canyon. Okay, so the trail kind of splits in two. Now that obviously looks like a ramp that somebody would use to jump over a canyon, but I'm pretty sure he didn't jump off any natural earthen ramp. They built a scaffolding for him. Because first of all, well, if you don't remember the incident, I'll take you back in time. He had this, it wasn't even a Harley Davidson because he knew a Harley Davidson was way too heavy to make it across this canyon, which the Harley was what he normally rode on. So for this, he had this special oh god what they call it a sky cycle developed yeah this engineer built him this weird frankly it looked more like a rocket than it looked like a motorcycle but uh it was erected on some kind of scaffolding so i don't think they needed any kind of natural hill to launch off of that being said we'll, we'll still hike up to the top of that hill and look at the view and pretend we are evil knievel about to jump across this chasm, which golly, he must have been doped up on something or, you know, maybe adrenaline probably was his dope. And so he didn't need to take anything aside from painkillers. I mean, I read he has the Guinness world record of the most broken bones in a lifetime. I want to say he had over 400 broken bones in his lifetime. And I'm not sure that's right. Don't quote me on it. Uh, but so he was probably taking a lot of painkillers. But before these big jumps, I, I don't know if he was nervous or not. <laughs> you know, maybe he just shotgunned a beer and called it a day. Oh, there is a sign here. Let's see what it says. Oh, yeah, there he is. In case you forgot what he looked like, Evil Knievel. You can see here on the sign, his real name was Robert Craig Knievel. And what I've read and heard is he got the, the nickname Evil because uh, he's from Butte, Montana. Okay, rough and tumble mining town. And he got into some trouble up there and he ended up in jail. And there was this other dude in town whose last name was Knoffel, K-N-A-U-F-E-L, Knoffel, nice German guy. Or maybe not so nice because his nickname was Awful Knoffel. And so he, I guess Robert Craig Knievel happened to be in jail with Awful Knoffel. And they were kind of joking around like, oh yeah, we got an Awful Knoffel. Well, now we got an Evil Knievel. And that's how he got that nickname. And I think he purposely misspelled it because he didn't want to be evil. He was a good, patriotic, Christian man. He wasn't trying to, you know, proclaim any allegiance to Satan or anything like that. He was just a daredevil. And the best one there ever was, if I might say so myself. I mean, just look at that all-American beefcake. Anyway, the sign basically just goes into his history, how he started jumping rattlesnakes. I guess he jumped over a bunch of rattlesnakes, jumped over cars, went on to have his own daredevil traveling show and people would come from miles around 
around to see him do all these crazy tricks. And then it goes into, this is the location where Evil Knievel built the ramp used in his historical attempt to jump the Snake River Canyon. It says Knievel invested nearly a million dollars and leased 300 acres for $35,000 for the crowd and legal permits. Okay, because a bunch of people showed up here to watch this thing. If nothing else, he was like... P.T. Barnum, he was a master of drumming up publicity. In fact, the way he got the deal to jump those Caesars Palace fountains in the first place, he called the owner of Caesars Palace, like disguised his voice and pretended to be journalists. I think he called him over and over again, pretending to be different journalists going, hey, we heard this evil Knievel is gonna jump the fountain in front of Caesars Palace, is that true? And he just kept calling until finally the owner of Caesars was like, well, hell, I better call this evil Knievel and get him to jump this fountain. That's the kind of carny Evil Knievel was. And so when he planned this Snake River jump, I mean, he promoted it heavily. Look at this old poster advertising it. See, that's the Sky Cycle. I guess it was still made by Harley Davidson. It was just heavily modified. I'm not sure. There's actually a picture of it over here. You can see. <laughs> Doesn't look anything like any Harley Davidson I've ever seen, but it still has that same... Red, white, and blue, Evil Knievel branding. There he is, you know, he'd always raise his fist up. Anyway, he promoted this thing super, super heavily. So, gosh, my understanding is thousands of people came out here to witness this jump. I mean, I guess he started promoting it weeks, maybe even months ahead of time. It kind of sounded like the, like a burnout biker version of Woodstock. Apparently all these bikers, motorcyclists, dirt bikers, you know, gearhead types, and their girlfriends, basically descended on this very quiet, peaceful little town of Twin Falls, which is a very quaint, cute little Mormon town. It probably was even more so back in 1974. So here's this nice, quiet Mormon town, and thousands of these rowdy beer drinking bikers all descend on your town, like, we're here to see Evil Knievel jump the canyon. And even though he leased, what did it say, he leased 300 acres? Well, he only leased land on either side of the canyon to do the jump. I mean, I guess he was supposed to land over on that side. How about that? I got swept up in all this storytelling and I forgot to even, I mean, let's just think for a minute that I guess the scaffolding was somewhere there and he attempted to jump all the way to the other side. And it looks like there's a dirt road leading to the other side. I'll zoom in. Not sure you can see that. And I don't even know if you can get out there, but that's, I guess, where he was supposed to have landed. And we'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's just imagine these thousands of rowdy beer swilling hippies you know i think it cost 25 dollars a ticket to come here and watch this jump which in 1974 that was a lot of money 25 dollars a ticket and so they just sort of assumed maybe rightfully so that oh uh, 25 bucks you know we'll get to see the thing it'll pay for a place to camp no camping was not included so my understanding is that all these crazy bikers and i'm saying dirtbag and i don't mean to disparage bikers obviously i love me some bikers but you know, it was a sort of an unsavory crowd. It was, this was 1974, so it was after Easy Rider. It was after the sort of summer of love, hippie dippy stuff, after the Manson family. You know, the crowd had turned a little rougher, shall we say. And so all these people are out here squatting, basically, camping out, having their fires, pissing. God only knows where they were pooping. I mean, it must've been an absolute disaster for Twin Falls and Evil Knievel's people did provide some infrastructure. I mean, they had these, I guess this was back before there were porta potties. So what I was reading is they had these wooden outhouses that probably reeked to high heaven. And apparently the crowd got real rowdy and burned them down on top of it all. So it was basically just a huge mess. And then to make things worse, I also read that, you know, he had vendors selling Evil Knievel t-shirts and merchandise because he was the king of the carnies. I'm surprised Colonel Tom Parker didn't try to manage Evil Knievel. Well, they probably would have just butted heads, like tried to out Carney the other. So maybe it wouldn't have been such a good idea. Anyway, so he had t-shirts for sale and they did have beer for sale, but apparently the event was sponsored by Schlitz beer. And I'm not a beer drinker, so I don't know if, Schl I mean, I think Schlitz is not considered to be a very good beer. And people were disappointed. You know, people came from all around the country out here to Idaho to watch this thing. Well, we're out here in the West. And when folks came out West back in the seventies, what did they want to drink? Coors, that's right. Coors beer from the Rocky Mountains. But Schlitz, I guess, bought the advertising rights, whatever. Schlitz was the only thing served. And I think that might have pissed off the attendees even more because I, I read they, I, I'm not sure if, if they held up and robbed uh, a refrigerated delivery truck. I don't know, somehow they stole a whole bunch of beer. And so everybody was out here drinking beer and getting hopped up and 
you know, waiting anxiously for the moment when Evil Knievel would finally attempt this jump. But I think they were out here for a few days until finally September 8th arrived. Oh, and look at this. If I would have just read this sign earlier, <laughs> remains of the ramp are still visible where the giant 180 foot structure once stood. The concrete blocks about two thirds of the way up the dirt mound held the structure. Oh yeah, look, there is, there's a little piece of concrete up there and that I guess was, so the scaffolding must have been on top of this hill. So it says on September 8th, 1974, Evil Knievel prepared for the most spectacular stunt of his life, a jump over the Snake River Canyon. Thousands of spectators gathered on the canyon rim and millions more tuned in on television to see if even Evil had a breaking point. A helicopter was used to transport Knievel to the seat in his steam powered X2 Sky Cycle. Remember that was that thing. And that would have been up there. And then it says, the national anthem was sung, speeches were given, and the countdown began. At 3.34 p.m., in a puff of smoke, Evil Knievel shot over the Snake River Canyon at nearly 300 miles per hour. Okay, let's go up this hill. Ooh, it's steep and very slippery. I probably should have hiked up the other side. But you know me, Evil Knievel, my spirit animal. Okay, yeah, look, here's a big piece of riprap that was part of the original scaffolding. I mean, if I wanted to, I guess I could even take a piece home with me as a souvenir. But you know me, I don't like to take things from the places I visit. Let's leave some riprap for the next Evil Knievel enthusiast. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and climb all the way to the top, up to the tippy top, so we can put ourselves in Evil Knievel's shoes. And imagine, we're up here, on a beautiful September day in 1974. Do you remember where you were on September 8th, 1974? Did you watch Evil Knievel attempt to make this jump? Oh my God, <laughs> looking at it from up here is pretty freaky. Anyway, so there was some kind of scaffolding erected up here on this little hill overlooking the mighty Snake River Canyon, which I think, and I'm all kinds of turned around, but I think where we just were at Shoshone Falls it's right down that way. We're only like less than a mile downstream, I think. Oh gosh, I'm terrible with directions. Anyway, so we're sitting here. We just got lowered by helicopter into our sky cycle and we're revving our engine and we're about to launch into space and basically fly across this gaping chasm. I don't know what his pre-jump rituals were, but maybe he said a little prayer. Maybe he shotgunned another beer. Maybe he popped a pill. What do I know? All I know is at 3.34, he launched. <laughs> into the wide blue yonder, hoping to land on the other side of the canyon. But of course, that's not what happened. <laughs> if you were alive back then and paying attention, well, you might remember that what happened was he launched and then his parachute deployed prematurely. And I've actually heard some talk that it was maybe done purposefully because I don't think he even expected to be able to make this jump. From what I've heard, he actually had a sense of foreboding before this jump, like just this pit of dread at the bottom of his stomach, which he normally didn't have apparently when he was jumping over rattlesnakes and big rigs. But he had this feeling of doom that something was gonna go wrong and. So I don't know if he had them engineer the parachute to deploy early on purpose or what, but his jump ended up being cut short and he started floating down. Down, down, down into the bottom of the Snake River Canyon. And oh my gosh, can you imagine what a disaster it could have been if he landed in the water? You know, it doesn't say that you can't go on the other side of this fence. So I'm gonna climb through the fence. I wanna look right over the edge of the canyon where he actually fell down. Okay guys, I hope you're not afraid of heights. Uh, I'm gonna go, well, there's the jump right behind me. So I guess right here would be the exact point where he launched off. Oh my, oh, look at the kayakers down there. Oh my gosh, it looks so nice down there right now. But if you're strapped to a giant parachute, which would get totally soaked with water and become very heavy, and I imagine drag you down to the bottom, well, being in that river wouldn't be so much fun at all. I mean, even if he didn't get sucked under and drowned immediately, well, just downstream a bit, there's another set of waterfalls and rapids, and he surely would have gotten pretty banged up in that. But I guess what's another few broken bones to a guy like Evil Knievel, who did have the Guinness world record in the total number of broken bones in a lifetime. But actually what ended up happening is, so he launched into the sky, the parachute deployed, 
And then I guess the wind was, you could say, working in his favor. It blew him backwards away from the water. And so I guess he just landed right down there on the, well, I was going to say riverbank. But you can see it's really not a soft landing. I mean, there's lots of jaggedy rocks. And I mean, even if he landed in those bushes, that probably wouldn't have been a very good place to land either. But believe it or not, the only damage he suffered was a broken nose. That's right, the man who broke more bones than any man in the history of men and jumped off of this dirt berm attempting to clear this chasm and fell 1,200 feet, only broke his nose. How about that? Talk about a real American hero. <laughs> I guess that parachute did its job. Okay, well, I actually think it might be interesting to do a little game of let's pretend. Okay, you know how I pointed out earlier that it looks like there's a dirt road that goes right to the other side of this canyon, directly across from the point where Evil Knievel launched his sky cycle? Well, I think we should try to drive over to that side of the canyon, to the end of that dirt road, and imagine how differently things might have turned out if Evil Knievel had made that jump. Okay, we're here on the other side of the Snake River Canyon. How about that? The dirt road comes right up to the edge of the canyon. And you can see straight across to that dirt mound where we were just standing. In fact, there's somebody else standing up there now. <laughs> it's funny, there was actually more people there than I expected. I mean, nobody was there when I got there, but over the course of my filming, uh, I want to say at least three families showed up with kids and it was cute because you could tell Evil Knievel didn't mean anything to the kids. They never heard of Evil Knievel, but the parents were trying to get the kids excited. Like there was this man and he had a motorcycle and he tried to jump the thing and the kids were like, it's hot, just take a picture of us so we can get out of here. One of the guys was even had a British accent. I'll bet you anything they're visiting from the UK, traveling around the US and you know, stopping at all the places that are interesting. Well, maybe interesting to the parents, not so much for the kids. Which is really funny because Evil Knievel was such an icon for kids back in the day, you know? Like, didn't uh, they sell all kinds of crazy Evil Knievel toys? Like, my sister and I, Evil Knievel was really before our time, but even we had, like, some kind of weird Evil Knievel tricycle thing we used to ride around on, and I know they sold all kinds of motorcycles, little toy action figures. I mean, he must have made a ton of money just on toys alone. But yeah, kids today, they don't know. Well, this is an interesting perspective from over here. Here you can see those rapids that he would have been swept into had he been swept into the river downstream. And then up here on the other side, it's actually, I think you can actually camp here. How cool would that be? I mean, if it wasn't so dang hot out here, I'd camp here myself tonight because I think camping at the site where Evil Knievel planned to land would be very interesting. It's like an alternate reality campsite. Okay, let's all imagine that Evil Knievel on September 8th, 1974, 3.34 p.m., he blasted off, but instead of his parachute deploying, let's imagine that the sky cycle just kept going. Okay, let's imagine the sky cycle launched off the scaffolding on that little dirt hill, sailed into the wild blue yonder across this mighty river gorge and came to a, well, probably still a pretty bumpy landing right here on the other side. You know, how differently would things have turned out? Okay, September 8th, 1974, what happened after that? Well, let's see, Elvis died in 77. I think Watergate was Watergate after September 8th, 74. I don't know, but then there was any number of terrorist attacks and wars after that. Well, imagine if Evil Knievel had actually made that jump, it might have tweaked something in the cosmos and we wouldn't have had any of those terrible things. You know, maybe, maybe Nixon would have turned out to be an honest guy. And maybe Elvis would have started dieting and exercising and he'd still be with us today. And well, maybe there wouldn't have been any Iran-Contra scandals and maybe there wouldn't have been any 
September 11th, and maybe there wouldn't have been any Afghan Afghanistan war, Iraq war. Maybe there wouldn't be any school shootings. Who can say how different the world today would be if Evil Knievel had only made that jump? You know, if the promise of the American dream had only been fulfilled, how different would all of our lives be today? Maybe you wouldn't have knocked up that girl in high school. Maybe you wouldn't have had to get married so young. Maybe you wouldn't have had to go get that job in the sandpaper factory and you could be traveling around in a sprinter van talking to your camera in the beautiful American West. What do I know? All of our lives, well, I suppose my life wouldn't be any different because I wasn't born yet, but anybody who was born then, take a minute to think about what might have been. Speaking of camping up here, it looks like there's a really cool little flat campsite right down there overlooking the river. I think we should hike down to it. I gotta be careful though because <laughs> I'm wearing flip-flops as usual and I'm pretty sure they don't call this the Snake River for nothing. There's probably like 10,001 rattlesnakes hiding in this boulder field so I'm gonna have to be real careful. Ugh, made it! Oh man, this is actually a super awesome place to camp. it sounds like someone's shooting over there. You know, back in Evil Knievel's day, you heard that sound and you would have just thought it was fireworks. They didn't have any random mass shootings back in Evil Knievel's day. And here at the alternate reality campsite, well, we haven't had any mass shootings either, so I'm just gonna pretend that those popping sounds are nothing more than somebody opening a whole bunch of six packs of beer, the old fashioned way with the pop top. You know, speaking of beer, this would be an epic place to sit and drink a beer. If I didn't have to drive after this, I totally would. Cause man, what a view, what a place to sit and have a brewski or two or even three. Well, I guess since I'm in an alternate reality universe over here, anyway, maybe I will just sit down and have a alternate universe reality imaginary beer. Cheers, or ranch water, not beer. Ugh. Man, it sure is pretty. But also, man, these rocks sure are hot. I can't sit there very long, my buns are burning. Okay, well I guess there's really nothing more to say about this late great American, what do they call it, anti-hero. I consider Evil Knievel an anti-hero because he was a jerk in his personal life by all accounts. And he was a hypocrite. He was always talking about stay in school and don't do drugs. Well, he was taking every prescription painkiller there was and if he was still alive today there's no doubt that he'd be addicted to opioids so he was not a man without his flaws but he still gave hope and enjoyment and happiness to a lot of little kids and a lot of people maybe even the people who showed up here to watch him try that jump that ill-fated day oh gosh how long ago was that almost 50 years ago 49 years ago that happened. Wow, time sure does fly. So I guess I'll just end this by saluting, or maybe uh, doing a, didn't he always raise his fist or something at the end of a jump, like to show everybody that he was okay? Do one of those Evil Knievel fist raises in the memory of Evil Knievel, one of America's greatest anti-heroes. Long may your legacy remain in our hearts. Uh, okay, now I'm getting out of here before I get shot. <laughs>